So if you ever come home after just a long day of work, you know, you're super exhausted, you walk in the door, excited to see your free friend, but unfortunately you find that your dog or cat had vomited all over the house. Now, this has definitely happened to many other people. It's definitely happened to me before. And so we're going to talk today about vomiting and diarrhea, just how to navigate through this mess. So stay tuned with us. Hi, and welcome to Vetsplanation. I'm your veterinary host, Dr. Sugarman, and I'm going to teach you about veterinary medicine. In this podcast, we can dive deeper into the understanding of what our pets are going through and break down medical terms into easier to understand chunks of information. Just a quick disclaimer, this podcast is for informational purposes only. This is not meant to be a diagnosis for your pet. If you have questions about diagnostics or treatment options, please talk to your veterinarian about those things. Remember, we are all practicing veterinary medicine, and medicine is not an exact science. Your veterinarian may have different treatment options and different opinions. The information I provide here is to help pet parents have a better understanding about their pets. If you like our podcast, please consider sharing this podcast with at least one friend or just somebody else who has pets as well. Now, let's jump into this week's episode. All right, welcome back. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening in. Today, we're going to be talking about vomiting and diarrhea. We're going to start out with just with what vomiting and what diarrhea is. The interesting thing is people would think that you know exactly what vomiting is, right? You're like this stuff that comes out of the dog's mouth that shouldn't come out of the mouth. But it's actually a lot more complicated than that. We have to discern between vomiting and regurgitation and actually coughing. Like many people don't think that those three look very similar, but they actually do. So let's talk about the differences of those first. So vomiting, you're actually going to see your pet like when they're like that really dramatic, like their whole belly is caving in every time they're trying to vomit type thing. It's a very dramatic scene most of the time when they are vomiting. So they'll be retching, they're trying to get something up, and then finally that food comes up. You know, so their whole body is involved with that. Versus regurgitation, that's usually very quiet. You don't notice that they do it. So maybe they're just walking and there's suddenly just like stuff comes from their mouth. But it's not like, it's not like the whole dramatic, their belly is moving in. They're moving as they're trying to, to get all that stuff out. It's very quiet. And sometimes you don't even notice it because they'll swallow it back down. But regurgitation is going to be much different than vomiting. And then our third one is coughing. Again, it seems like it would be, it would be like, I know I would cough between a vomit, right? But in kennel cough, which I've talked about before on a previous episode, what you hear is just that the dog seems like it's hacking or it is retching. And then suddenly just white foam comes up and they'll do that over and over again, especially when they're excited or if they have a, like a leash or a collar on their, their neck. Um, so it's going to be something that's, that's usually just white foam that's coming up. That's like a cough that we have to determine what the difference is between those things. A lot of people come into me saying the dog is vomiting. And then when I talk to them more about it, um, it ends up being that the dog has kennel cough uh, because they're just coughing up this white foam. Just watching them to see what they're doing will really help to determine whether they're vomiting, regurgitating, or if they have, they're retching to get like coughing. So that also helps us to determine like what the right clinical signs are and what the right treatment is going to be for each one of those things, because they're actually very different. And we're also going to do different tests depending on which one it is as well. So just watching them. And if you're just not sure, another really good thing to do is get it on video. I know it seems weird to just get a video of your dog vomiting, but that is the easiest way for us to know what they're doing is if we can physically see it. And most of the time they're not doing that in the clinic. Most of the time they're actually going to be very nervous when they're there, their adrenaline is rushing. And so there's, they're not going to vomit for us. They're not going to cough for us. They're not going to regurgitate for us. So the easiest way is for you to get it on video for us to be able to see. So that's vomiting. Let's talk about diarrhea now. Again, you're probably like, I know what diarrhea is, right? But I actually find that a good majority of people don't. So most people come into me saying that their dog is constipated because they see their dog going outside and attempting to go to the bathroom, like they're straining to go and nothing is coming out as far as they see. But a good 90% of the time, they're actually having diarrhea. They're having this urge that they have to go to the bathroom and they're going outside and just having little tiny drops of this really liquid stool. So it's most of the time that they're having diarrhea, not that they're constipated. 
if it's a cat, I will see most of the time in, with constipation, it's mostly going to be a cat that's constipated. So with them, a lot of times you'll see them again, go to the litter box, you'll see them straining, nothing coming out. So if it's an older cat, especially, or a cat that has a really small tail, those are the cats that I'm more worried about it being a constipation cat. But in general, like I said, for dogs, a, a good 90% of the time, this is going to be diarrhea. So if you see them go outside and trying to strain, go look to see if there's any little bits coming out because my guess is it's probably diarrhea, not constipation. The other thing to look for is obviously if they're in the house and they have an accident and you see the diarrhea, then you pretty much know. I will say one caveat to that is I've definitely had ones that the owner thought it was or the pet parent thought it was going to be diarrhea, but it ended up being vomit because it just looked so much the same because of a foreign body. If you see them have the accident, that's even better because we know that that's what it is. All right. So now we've described what vomiting and diarrhea is. Let's talk about some of the most common reasons for them having vomiting and diarrhea. I'd say the most common thing that I see is going to be that they've gotten people food. So most of the time somebody, you know, Uncle Joe has given them some steak or something off of the, the plate or something really fatty. Or they got into the trash can that had a bunch of people food in it, something like that. So most of the time, for me, it's going to be that they got into some sort of people food, which then upset their stomach. That's called gastroenteritis. And I've talked about that in the previous podcast as well. You can go look that up if you want to hear more information on that. But gastro just means stomach and enteritis is going to be dealing with the intestines. So it's a gastroenteritis and inflammation of it. With those uh, a lot of times it's just like we've given them something or they've gotten into something. Another common cause is going to be that they've eaten something outside that we don't know about. So like there's certain leaves or branches that can cause them to have this effect of vomiting and diarrhea. Like rhododendrons is a really common one for that, especially like here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a lot of those. So that is a very common reason. Certain mushrooms can cause them to have vomiting and diarrhea as well. So I typically say that if you see mushrooms in the yard, try to just get rid of them. There are lots of different types of mushrooms, like tons and tons of different types of mushrooms. And a good majority of them will just cause an upset stomach, but unfortunately, some of them will cause some really bad things. We'll go over that in another podcast later on, but just try to get rid of those mushrooms. But that is another cause for vomiting and diarrhea. The third most common cause for me is going to be that the pet ate an object. So it ate some sort of toy or it ate uh, something out of the trash can that it shouldn't have or... It ate one of the kids' toys, things like that. You really have to like pay attention to see if there was anything that you can see missing. Maybe you saw a trash can knocked over recently, or you saw that there was something missing off of a counter, or your kid is saying that they're missing some Nerf bullets or something. Pay attention to those things to know. Another common reason is toxins eaten. So chocolate is a big toxin that I see. Tons of dogs eating chocolate, especially around the holidays. And then other toxins are going to be things like grapes, raisins, lot, lots of things that cause them to have vomiting and diarrhea. They can also cause other things as well. So if your dog's gotten into one of those toxins, I have most likely covered most of those by this point. So you can look at the previous podcast to look for those too. Serious infections. So things like parvovirus is very, very serious. So we want to make sure that if they are young pets or are not vaccinated, that we are thinking about parvovirus. Again, I've already covered that in one of the very beginning episodes of the podcast. And then also other illnesses. So like for older dogs, I start worrying about things like their liver, their kidneys, their pancreas. So we start thinking about those type of things to worry about those as well. And then other like interesting things to think of too is if like your dog is female and not spayed. They can get pyometras, which is an infection of the uterus. Again, I've covered this in a different podcast, so like you can listen to that as well. These are the most common things I see dogs and cats for, for vomiting and diarrhea. There are thousands of other things as well. I have to keep that in mind. These are the most common ones, but there are so many other things that can cause vomiting and diarrhea. We have to think about all the things that the pet could have potentially gotten into or done or based on their age, things like that, based on their breed. Uh, so we have to keep a lot of those things in mind. So let's talk about when it's important to go to the vets right away. And then we're going to talk about at-home treatment, but I want to make sure the instances why you should bring them in right away. So one thing is if they're having multiple occurrences of vomiting or diarrhea. 
So if they're vomiting just like constantly, and you can't get them to stop vomiting or they drink and they vomit. That to me is very concerning. They need to come in right away. We don't want something to get worse just because they're constantly vomiting and you're trying out home care and they're still continuing to vomit. So multiple occurrences of vomiting, they need to come in immediately. If they have vomiting for more than 12 hours. So what I mean by that is let's say in the morning they vomited, they didn't vomit at all for all day. You get home after work, suddenly you're going to bed, they vomit again. This isn't multiple occurrences of vomiting one right after the other. This is just like in a 12 hour time span, they vomited more than once. Yep, get them right in right away. Let's say they vomit today. They don't vomit all day or all night. They vomit tomorrow. You can get into your regular veterinarian at that point to see what's going on. If they're like eating okay, they're keeping their food down and stuff. But I'd say more than once in a 12 hour period, they need to come in. Diarrhea. Diarrhea is an interesting one. They can have multiple episodes of diarrhea. I'm not too terribly concerned about that. If they're having diarrhea for more than 24 hours and you're doing stuff at home to treat for it, then yeah, they should probably come in to be seen. And especially if they're little, the smaller they are, like there's these teeny tiny teacup puppies, like Yorkies and stuff, they get dehydrated very quickly. So I don't really want those guys to wait 24 hours. They should probably come in a little bit more immediately. But for most dogs, 24 hours with treating it, they should be back to normal. If your pet is really lethargic, meaning they don't want to get up, they don't want to move, or they don't want to do their normal daily things, then I'm worried about that as well. Anytime you have blood in the vomit or the stool, and this can be tiny flecks of, of blood, and that's okay. A lot of times I'll see that and it's not too worrisome for me, but I still want to get the vomiting to stop before it turns into something big. But what I'm mostly concerned about is that there can be blood in the vomit or the stool, and it's due to something really bad. So it can be due to something like they have a problem with their platelets, which are really important dumping blood clots, or they might have a clotting problem. So we need to make sure that we get those guys seen sooner than later. If you see parasites, so like maybe you have a stool sample and there's like parasites in it, uh, Dr. Z is going to be talking to us uh, here soon about like lots of different parasite stuff. but some of the big ones that I see is like the really long spaghetti-like worms. Those are called roundworms. And they're very small rice-like worms called tapeworms. Both of those are typically seen in vomiting or diarrhea. Well, mostly, mostly roundworms for vomiting. Not so much the tapeworms for vomiting. But they can both be seen in the diarrhea as well or just in normal stool. So those guys do need to be seen. Again, it's not like an emergency. You don't have to walk in right into the emergency room right then. But... You should be seen sooner than later. If they're very painful, like you see them doing that down dog stretch, that's to me pain. Or if you touch their belly and they're very painful, those are instances they need to come in right away as well. We need to get that pain under control. And again, I worry more about them eating an object. If that's the case. Also, if you know that they have eaten an object, if you saw that they ate a sock two days ago or they got into the trash can two days ago, those are really important things to know. Or even if they ate a corn cob a couple days ago or weeks ago, like we need to know those things. And also you need to bring them right away if they have been vomiting, because then we worry about that stuff getting stuck in the intestines. The crazy thing about the stomach is it can have things bounce around the stomach, like all over for, for days, weeks, or even years. There has been like a documented dog that ate like a corn cob a couple of years prior, and it was just bouncing around in the stomach. So we need to know if they've eaten something and if you know that they've eaten something, bring them down right away because I'm more worried about it being stuck at that point. Dehydration is another big one. People always say, I've felt their nose and their nose is wet. That's actually not a way that we check for dehydration at all. Their nose can be dry. I don't really care if it's dry or wet. That just tells me that they've licked their, their nose. That's about it. The things you do want to check for is actually their gums. If you just put your finger on their gums, and check to see if it's moist. If it's really dry or what we call tacky, then they're probably dehydrated. Or the other one is called the skin tent. That's where you take the skin on the back of their neck and you just pull it up and then you check to see if it goes back right away. Neither one of these are very accurate, but there are still some sort of good way to check for dehydration. Really the best way for us to check for dehydration is we're looking for if their eyes are sunken in and things like that. But, but the most important thing to look for dehydration is actually their blood work. 
the blood work will tell us if they're dehydrated or not. Some older cats, cats who have like kidney problems or thyroid problems, if we pull the skin up on their back, it's actually going to stay there because that's just normal for them. It's just the laxity of their skin in older cats that they just, it's just not going to go back. Things like your dog's gums being moist or dry. If they just walked over and drank a bunch of water, of course it's going to be moist because they just drank. So you want to make sure you catch them when they're not drinking water to see if they're dehydrated or not. And I always suggest doing that too, like when they're normal, like literally right now, go home, check to see what their gum is so that we know what their gums are like when it's normal. All right. So let's now talk about the at-home treatments, like things that you can do at home to try to help with this vomiting and diarrhea if it's not something that's serious enough to go into the vet for. So some of the things that you can do are if your pet is vomiting, Take away their food for 12 hours. We don't want to upset their stomach, so just take it away for a little bit. So that way we can just make sure that their stomach is able to settle down. Again, if they start vomiting more and more and more, even though you've taken away your food, then I'm worried about that there's something else that's going on. But let's say you take away the food, they seem to be doing okay, they stop vomiting, then let's go ahead and give them something to eat. But not their regular food, and this will give you some time to prepare this, but uh, most of the time we want them to eat a very bland diet. There are some diets that you can do for just a couple of days, like literally two, three days. Um, so things that you can do at home are going to be things like boiled chicken breast, boiled, skinless, boneless chicken breast, no additives, don't put any butter, no seasoning, no salt, nothing. And it has to be boiled. You don't want to put it into the broiler or bake it or even the air fryer because you'll still have too much fat on there. So just boiled chicken breast. And I also suggest don't go to the store to get it. A lot of people will go to, to get like the rotisserie chicken, but they put like extra stuff in there, right? Like they're, they want that breast to be moist. And so they're going to put butter and oil and lots of other things into it, which is just going to increase the amount of fat that they're going to get. And that's going to make their stomach upset. We need very, very bland food. So you can either boil the chicken breast yourself. Or you can even go to the store to get canned chicken and water. It'll usually be by the tuna section, the canned tuna section. And just water, not an oil. So you can do chicken breast and rice. White rice is probably preferable, but brown rice is okay as well. And it's just a volume of one to one ratio. I usually say, let's say you feed your dog one cup of food in the morning and one cup of food at night. So instead, you're going to feed half a cup of chicken with half a cup of rice in the morning half a cup of chicken with half a cup of rice in the evening. So it'd be the same one-to-one -one that you would give to your dog with their dog food. And the same thing with what you would give to them, like half chicken, half rice. The other thing about this, you can also do things like low-fat cottage cheese, or you can also do egg whites, not the whole scrambled egg. You can scramble egg whites. That is okay. And use that as well. Again, you got to make sure that though you're not putting in an oil, you're not putting butter in there. It's got to be very bland. For cats, I'm a little more wary about those. Cats don't often want to eat food that is not their own food. I do suggest you try doing it, but if they're not going to eat it, I'm not going to be terribly concerned. I usually just give them their own food then if that's the case because there's, they're just very picky. The other things that you can try is a, a diet. So a really bland diet that's a canned food that's usually made by like a prescription food. Now, we only want to do that chicken and rice or the low-fat cottage cheese or the egg whites for just a couple of days. The reason why is because there's just not all the nutrients that we need in it. There's not all the minerals that we need in, to, in it to be able to help the pet heal. So we want something that's going to be a very well-rounded diet. So if you can, I usually will talk to people about, okay, if your pet is having vomiting or diarrhea, let's put them on a bland diet for just a couple of days, like a bland canned food or dry food, whichever they prefer. That's a prescription diet. And that's the reason why is because it has all the minerals and all the nutrients and stuff that I need in it. So some of those are going to be like Purina EN, Hills ID, the Royal Canin, GI Low Fat. Those are the three most common ones that we're going to be using. And let's say you're seen for diarrhea before, and let's say your dog's having diarrhea like in two weeks from now. You could ask them for like extra cans of GI low fat or whatever it is, whatever canned food that they have or wet food or dry, sorry, dry food that they have. That's a bland diet. 
You can ask for extra ones. Most people or most vets will be okay with that, giving a couple extra because at least you'll have some on hand for the next time that happens. Or unfortunately, you can't just walk into any vet clinic and just ask for it. They have to be seen in order to get a prescription for it. So that's why I just say that usually it's good to try to get that ahead of time. So even if you're going in for vaccines, you could ask them, can I have a couple of cans of of some sort of low fat food just so that that way I'm prepared for if they do end up having diarrhea anytime soon. All right, so now it's just like the diet. You do that for a couple of days just until this vomiting and diarrhea has subsided. We want to make sure that their stomach has been able to have time to settle down. It's interesting that they used to do in humans called the brat diet. So it's applesauce, rice, and I can't remember what the other one was. But the but they always said to do like this really like this diet that was just going to be just not a lot of stuff in it. So that, that way they just, you just feel better, but they've also got away from that in humans as well. And they've done more, okay, we need to have more nutrition, more, more whole foods to try to help people's stomachs feel better. All right. So let's say we've got that, the vomiting under control. Now we've had to get the diarrhea under control. So the, the low fat foods are going to help with that as well. Those really bland foods are going to help with the diarrhea, but some other things that you can do, let's say if you don't have time to go into the vet and it's just, you know, like I said, not having diarrhea for that long. There's no blood in it. You can try using what's called Xylem husk powder. You can find that pretty much at any grocery store, but it has shown to improve diarrhea because it helps to bulk things up. Most people will ask me about pumpkin. Pumpkin is actually not that great for bulking things up. It has some fiber, but this is really going to have a lot more to that to help bulk it up. So that, that way we can help improve that diarrhea. And like I said, it can be purchased over the counter. I just make sure when you're looking for it, look at the back of the package to make sure that it says that there's no xylitol or sweetener added. It should just be very plain. Uh, xylitol I've talked about before in a previous episode, but that's really deadly. It can cause really low blood sugar. It can also cause liver problems. So look at the back of the package and check to see if xylitol, spelled X-Y-L-I-T-O-L, xylitol. So there should be no xylitol in it at all. If there is, then don't get that. You need to get a different one. The dose is pretty simple. So if you have a small dog, they're going to get about two grams of the husk powder with every meal. A medium dog is about four grams and a large dog is about six grams. It comes in a powder. So you just mix it into some wet food or with the chicken and rice. So you do that for a couple of meals until their, their diarrhea starts to form up to regular stools again. I also usually warn people too that when their diarrhea is starting to subside, they might seem like they are constipated for about two to three days. And that's okay. That's just a lot of the diarrhea is just like the water is being pulled from a lot of their stool. And so it's making it form up. So it's okay for a couple of days if it seems like they're not having a bowel movement. That's pretty normal. And then after that, they usually go back to being normal again. And that's when you know you can you know, stop doing the husk powder. You can go back to the regular diet just slowly. When we go back to that regular diet too, you don't want to just go immediately from the chicken and rice or the GI low fat or whatever it is that you're going to use directly to their food. You actually want to slowly transition them so their stomach gets back to being used to having their normal dog food or normal cat food. And when you do that, you're going to do about three quarters of the bland food with about a quarter of their food for about three days and then half and half for three days and then one quarter of the bland food for three days with three quarters of their regular food for three days. So we just want to slowly mix it back in rather than just like putting them directly onto that diet. I always tell people too, like if you have planned to change their diet, uh, this is a good time to do that because then you can slowly get them onto the new diet as well. The other big thing I just want to mention too is about not feeding them with a syringe or, or an eyedropper or giving them water that way. When you do that, I've had a lot of dogs that have actually had aspiration pneumonia from that. So people, you kind of like shoot it into their mouth, right? But you don't realize that the beginning of their trachea is like right here. The trachea is your windpipe. And if you shoot food or water down in there, it's going to go into their lungs. So I don't suggest feeding them with a dropper or a syringe. Um, people worry that they don't drink enough when they're eating foods like the chicken and rice or the canned bland foods, like the prescription foods I was talking about. But actually that has so much more water in it 
than a normal dry food does. So they're actually getting plenty of water that way. So you don't have to supplement them with more water. They're going to get it just from what you're giving them. All right, guys, so that's it for vomiting and diarrhea. So now we're going to move on to our animal fact. So today we're going to be talking about the lowland streaked tenric. So there are lots of different types of tenrics. But if you don't know what these are, go look them up. Again, super crazy. Definitely look up the lowland streaked tenric too. Like you can look up all the other ones, but specifically look for that one. Okay. And so these guys are found in the, like the scrubland, tropical, lowland rainforests of Madagascar. So if you haven't looked it up yet, they look kind of like a really ragged hedgehog that was spray painted to look like a bumblebee. That's the best way I can describe them. Like I said, there are lots of different types of tenrics and they all come from, you, you think that they all are very familiar because they all have like certain attributes that are similar, but they also are all like their genetics are all divergent as well because they have things that are very different for them. Some of them look very much like a hedgehog. Some of them look more like a weasel or a rat. So definitely look them up so you can see. But so these guys, they are really big into family. They like being in groups into family units of about 20 tenrics. They'll dig deep burrows and then they'll also make like for themselves individually, but then they'll also make a really complex underground system so that each one of those burrows is connected so they can go visit all of their family units. I think that's really interesting because I can't imagine if I had an underground tunnel to go to like my mom's house or something. But they all like to be very closely knit together. Sometimes they'll go hunt together or sometimes they'll go hunt alone. It really just depends. So they're very interesting. And the most interesting thing about them is how they communicate. So they do something that is called stridulation. It's where they have these special quills on them that they use to rattle. So they'll rattle their spine and it rattles these quills. And that's how they'll communicate. But we cannot hear them, just their naked eye. We think that it uses ultrasonic sound to be able to, to communicate with each other. But they're the only mammals that are known to do this, which is super interesting. They'll also use other things like chemical signals. Um, they'll use a few noises for communication, but it's mostly the stridulation that they use. When they're threatened, they'll use their quills. They have all these quills that kind of surround their neck. So they'll use those quills to go up to the opponent and try to like prick at them. So they'll throw their head violently up towards them to try to prick them so that they'll go away. They'll also do things like what a hedgehog would do. Like they will ball up sometimes to protect their underbelly because all their quills are on their back. But mostly if they're threatened, they're going to try to go after their opponent. So super interesting little creatures, like I said, look them up because they're, they're real funny looking. All right, guys, I hope that all of this kind of helps you understand when we have pets who are having vomiting and diarrhea, what you can do at home and what you should do if like when you should bring them into the vet. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me or find me on, on Facebook is what I'm normally on the most or any other social media platforms. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And until next time, I'm going to be sending out a bonus episode just on some Thanksgiving stuff in general so that you know what to watch for for Thanksgiving. And I hope you guys all have a good holiday. So until then, keep your pets happy, healthy, and safe. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys for listening this week. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or you just want to say hi, you can email me at shugs, S-U-G-G-S, at vetsplanationpodcast.com. Or visit the website at vetsplanationpodcast.com or find us on Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok at Vetsplanation. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you back here next week.